This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. I welcome our dear brothers and sisters in al-Islam. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Your brother in Islam Bilal Ismail of the Al-Kawthar Institute and Imam Development Project with you for another majlis of ilm, another majlis of dhikr, another majlis of the days of Al-Islam, a majlis going through the series, Our Story, a chronological overview of the Muslim Ummah, walhamdulillah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, everyone has a story, and this is our story. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, we are currently going through the perfumed biography of none other than Muhammad ibn Abdullah, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. That Rasul, our Nabi, Muhammad Mustafa, that we will be asked about in our graves, subhanAllah. The one individual on Yawm Al-Qiyamah who would not be saying, nafsi, 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 but rather, Ummati, Ummati, my Ummah, my Ummah, subhanAllah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala in this majlis, majlis number 9, halaqa number 9, insha'Allah, we will be discussing the ghazwa of Al-Hudaybiyya or the sulh Al-Hudaybiyya, the treaty of Hudaybiyya, bi'ithnillahi, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. But before we get into those matters, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, a little bit of revision, insha'Allah. Then in our previous majlis, we discussed the battle of, the battle of Khandaq, the Ghazwa of Khandaq, when the Meccans had come and got together with various clans and tribes. You had the Jews of Banu, Qaynuqa' who were expelled from Medina al munawwara and now based in Khaybar. They go to the Meccans and they rouse up the Meccans, they incite the Meccans against the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslims. What's their aim and objective? To eliminate, to exterminate the Muslims of Medina al munawwara These people, the Jews who are now based in Khaybar, the Banu Qaynuqa, they previously attempted to assassinate Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and thus they were expelled. Some mention that they wanted their land back, they wanted to come back home, and the only way they could do this was to remove the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslims. Plus minus 10,000 they numbered, Allahu Musta'an. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, they lay siege to Medina al munawwara and they were surprised with the Khandaq, whose idea, Salman al-Farisi. And this Khandaq was plus minus 2.7 kilometers long, 3 meters deep, and 5 meters across. Walhamdulillah. This was in the north of Medina al munawwara As for the west and the east, well, you had these natural defenses, the mountains and the volcanic tracts, and so the enemy, the only accessible route would be from the north. As for in the south, that's where we had Banu Qurayza, the last of the three Jewish tribes in Medina al munawwara They were allies with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There were agreements between them and the Muslims, but subhanallah, they were treacherous. They deceived the Muslims and they swapped sides. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this matter in the noble Quran. إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ When they came from above you, the confederates, وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ And then from below you, meaning Banu Quraiza, Allah Musta'an. Now we are afraid our women, our children who are in the homes, they most likely will be attacked by the Banu Quraiza, Allah Musta'an. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, wa id zaghatil absar, wa balagatil kulubul hanajira, wa tazununa billahi zununa. When the 
uh, when the eyes uh, were struck وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرَةِ and the hearts reached into the throats and you thought those thoughts with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala هُنَالِكَ بِتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَزُلْزِلُ الزِّلَاتِ زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا this is when the believers were tested and it was like there was an earthquake below their feet وَإِذْ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٍ مَا وَعِدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا and the munafiqeen and those who have diseases in their hearts what did they say what Allah and his Rasul are promising these are only fairy tales when the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that large rock when he broke it during the preparation of the khandaq he said that I is that it is as though I can see the palaces of Persia, the palaces of Sham and Yemen, etc. So these people then say, he's promising the Muslims, promising us all of this here. But we're unable to even go to the toilet in peace, in safety right now. How can he talk about all of these matters? But this is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also we find that then many of the munafiqeen, what did they say? We need to go back home. Our, our, our homes are exposed. We need to go back home. Allahu musta'an. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah. We discussed the matter of the Banu Qurayza and they were sorted out after the confederates eventually, eventually left. We saw that that the majority of the historians state that between six to eight hundred of the Banu Qurayza, their fighting men, they were all executed for this major crime, this crime of treason, Allah Musta'an. As for Masjid Ar-Raya, we had stated the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was camped there when he was overseeing the preparation of the Khandaq. Masjid Al-Fath, where the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was standing and making dua, making dua when he had sent Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman into the camp of the enemy and Hudayfa comes back and he finds the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the middle of the night making dua. Allah sent his soldiers. What soldiers? The soldiers of wind. Walhamdulillah. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah. We discussed the betrayal of Banu Qurayza and also during the same time, the same year, there was the battle of Nainawa between the Persians and the Byzantine Romans and Heraclius the Byzantine Roman leader was able to defeat the Persians and he took back a lot of their lost territories. And so this is now when the Byzantines are making a comeback. Throughout the period of the Sira up till this moment, the Persians had the upper hand. But now it's the Byzantines, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. Also Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, between the events of the Khandaq, between the events of uh, Khandaq and Hudaybiyyah, Hudaybiyyah takes place in the year 6 after Hijrah, and Khandaq was in the year 5 after Hijrah. And so in between this period, the one year in between, there were some other incidents, for example, important ones, like the Islam of Thumama ibn Uthal. Thumama ibn Uthal was one of the tribal leaders of the Banu Hanifa tribe. Musaylima al-Kadhab, the false prophet, will also be from the same tribe. Thumama was captured. He was tied in the masjid of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we found that, uh, for example, the Hanafi scholars stating that this is evidence that a disbeliever can be brought even into the haram of Medina al munawwarah as was done with Thumama ibn Uthal. Why tied in the masjid? Maybe so that he could witness the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the lessons, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's interaction with the Sahaba. The Sahaba are all praying behind the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so maybe this could affect him. And that's exactly what happened. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to Thumama. So what do you say? He says that if my blood is spilt, it will not go unavenged. If you want money, then ask, you will get. If you want this, you will get. If you want that, you will get, etc. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leaves him. Second day, third day, similar answers he gave. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered the sahaba to set him free. 
He leaves the masjid, he takes an ablution, he comes back and he says, Oh Muhammad, before this day, there was no face more detested and hated to me like your face. But today it's the most beloved. And before this day, there was no religion more detested to me like your religion. But today it's the most beloved. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh and Thumama became our brother, walhamdulillah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, Thumama eventually goes to Makkah al mukarramah to perform an Umrah. And when some learn the fact that he is now Muslim, they wanted to interfere with him. He says to them, that if Muhammad does not give permission, I will not allow for the crops and the various caravans to pass by my land. And so subhanAllah, fast forward, these people suffered because Thumama was not allowing this to pass by and reach them and they send a Rasul, a messenger to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to intercede and to order Thumama to allow it to come through and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed mercy and asked Thumama to please allow for the caravans to reach them and the corn etc. to reach them. Ulama pull out from this here permissibility for for imposing an economic boycott, sanctions, etc., as was the action of Thumama ibn Uthal radiallahu ta'ala. An. Also, during the period between Khandak and Hudaybiyyah, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered the assassination of Salam ibn al huqiq He was from Khaybar. He was one of those who bankrolled the battle of Khandak. He was one of those who bankrolled the confederates coming together and laying siege to Medina al munawwarah Alhamdulillah, the Muslims were successfully in assassinating him. And uh, subhanAllah, we find that uh, another important incident was the fact that Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi, Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi is the son-in-law of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is married to Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, and obviously she is Muslim, he is not Muslim, and so he is living in Mecca al mukarramah she is living in Medina al munawwara and he was captured after the Battle of Badr, and part of the agreement was that you will return to Mecca, and you will send the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Zainab, you will allow her to migrate to Medina al munawwara and he did so. Now, there was a raid upon his caravan, and some historians mention he was captured. Some mention, no, he was not captured, he escaped. But what he did was, he comes to Medina al munawwara in the darkness of the night, he goes to Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha's home, and he asked her to grant him protection, and she did so. The next day in the masjid, she announces before any everyone that uh, Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi is around and I have granted him protection. Subhanallah. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam honored that. And eventually, uh, Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi, uh, he mentioned that whatever he had on the uh, caravan, that this didn't belong to him. And so we find that the Muslims had given back what was taken from him. And he returned back to Makkah al mukarramah sorted out that amana, And then he returns back to Medina al munawwara and announces his Islam. They said to him, why did you go? You should have kept all of those belongings, remained here and become Muslim. He says, no, that was an amana. I needed to sort it out. And after I've sorted it out, now I embrace Islam, alhamdulillah. And he later on will be reunited with Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha upon the original nikah, alhamdulillah. There was also the incident, Sariya Khabat, where the companions had gone out and they had very, very little food. They were suffering, suffering Allah Musta'an. And then subhanAllah, they were along the shore and a whale was washed up. And they ate from that carcass of that whale for days on end. And they had even brought some for the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina al munawwara walhamdulillah. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah. Those were some important incidents between Khandak and Hudaybiyyah. We now move on bi ta'ala to our major discussion. Hudaybiyyah subhanallah. The year 628 of the common era. The year 6 after Hijrah. The treaty of Hudaybiyyah 
which call for a cessation of hostilities between the Quraysh of Mecca al-Mukarramah and the Muslims of Medina al-Munawwara for a period of 10 years is signed after the Muslims were prevented from continuing their pilgrimage, their Umrah to Mecca al-Mukarramah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, some of the historians call it Sulh al hudaybiyya some of them call it, no, Ghazwatul hudaybiyya Ibn Abdul Bar, the famous uh, Maliki scholar, he states, Laysa fi ghazawati rasul there's uh, none from amongst the battles of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which uh, equal Badr, or Yaqrub minha, or even come close to the battle of Badr in its importance and greatness, illa ghazwatul hudaybiyya except the ghazwa of hudaybiyya Very, very, very important. What was the background with regards to Hudaybiyyah? Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sees in a dream. And the dreams of the Anbiya are true. And he saw that his head was shaven. He enters into the Kaaba. He has the keys of the Kaaba in his hands. And so subhanallah, this is a dream that he is uh, made tawaf. His uh, head has been shaven. He's entering the Kaaba. He's got the keys of the Kaaba, meaning go for Umrah, go for Umrah. And so the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he announces to the Sahaba, and they are elated. They are excited. Walhamdulillah. Remember that the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and many of the Sahaba. It's now been six years that they've left Makkah al mukarramah They haven't seen Makkah al mukarramah Remember Bilal and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala'an and others, they were sick when they had come, physically sick when they had settled in Medina al munawwara They were not used to the environment, the climate of Medina al munawwara Remember, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, that your Rasul, our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has a special emotional attachment with Makkah al mukarramah It's the land of his birth. It's also the land of Banu Hashim. His great-grandfather Hashim was the custodian of the Kaaba. It's uh, the land of uh, of Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the one who saw in his dream the location of the Zamzam, and so it was found by Abdul Muttalib. Alhamdulillah. We also know Abdul Muttalib and the incident with regards to the year of the elephant when Abraha had come. This, these, these are the family members of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and their close relationship, emotional attachment with Mecca al-Mukarramah. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was leaving Mecca, he turns to the city and he says that you are the most beloved of places to Allah. And had they not expelled me, had they not forced me out, I would never have left, subhanAllah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, the announcement is made and the Sahaba are excited and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted a large group to join in. Why? So that if the Quraysh feel that they will try to fight us, etc., at least we have a large number with us and that would provide support and as a deterrent to the Meccans. We do find that some of the Arabi tribes, some of the Bedouin tribes, uh, they made excuses. No, we, we, we're not ready, ready. We, no, now, now's not the right time. And they made excuses, Juhayna, Muzayna, etc. And they didn't join in. Some women also joined in. For example, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's wife, Um Salama, she was the one who joined in this, uh, in this journey. Nusayba, that woman who was from amongst the two who were present at the second Bay'atul Aqaba, pledge at Aqaba. Nusayba, also one of those who physically fought in the battle of Uhud, mashaAllah. And there were one or two others. Uh, the Sahaba generally didn't take any armor. They were in the state of ihram. They were wearing the ihram garments. They were in ihram. They were in the state of ihram. They were bareheaded. This is the sacred month of Dhul Qa'ada. They left on the first of Dhul Qa'ada. And in the month of Dhul Qa'ada, there's no fighting. It's one of the sacred months. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka 
الْمُلْكَ وَالْمُلْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكْ They are all in the talbiyah, masha'Allah. We find the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his lifetime in Islam, he had done four umrahs. One is the uh, uh, the umrah of Hudaybiyyah, then umratul qada, uh, which is the following year, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do another umrah. Then there is the umrah that he had done from Ji'rana, and the last one with his hajj. All four of the umrahs of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were done in the month of Dhul Qa'da. Who's in charge of Medina Al-Munawwara? Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum. He was put in charge, the blind companion, the mu'adhin of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also sent ahead of him a few spies to make sure everything is fine, to ascertain the reaction of the Quraysh, etc. As they got close to Makkah Al-Mukarramah, we find that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gets word that uh, at Usfan, that Khalid Ibn Walid has been dispatched with about 200 horsemen to stop the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims. What's the reaction of the Quraysh? We will not allow this. We will never allow this. This will give the Muslims prestige. We will never allow this. Allahu Musta'an. They felt that their pride would be dented. Remember, one year ago, they came to exterminate the Muslims and they were unsuccessful. And now it would seem that the Muslims have the audacity in their eyes, the Muslims have the audacity to come all the way to Mecca al mukarramah What do they want? What are they coming for? Do they want to take over? Do they just want to perform the pilgrimage? Nonetheless, even if it's just the pilgrimage, we will not allow it. It must be done on our terms, not on their terms. Allahu Musta'an. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he orders that the caravan of Muslims, that they change direction. Because he doesn't want a confrontation. He doesn't want conflict. He doesn't want any spilling of blood. We've come for Umrah. We've not come to fight. This is a clear sign. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was trying his level best to avoid any fighting. And so they take a different route. And this route was a very difficult route. And it eventually brings them to Hudaybiyyah. They reach Hudaybiyyah, or today it's called Shumaysi, the south of Mecca al-Mukarramah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's camel by the name of Qaswa, it stopped. The people said that Qaswa is being stubborn. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam defended the honor, defended Qaswa subhanallah, and said that مَا خَلَأَتِ الْقَصْوَى وَمَا ذَاكَ لَهَا بِخُلُقْ وَلَكِنْ حَبَسَهَا حَابِسَ الْفِيلِ that it is unbecoming upon Qaswa to be stubborn. It's not part of her nature. Rather, the one who stopped the elephants has stopped Qaswa, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped the elephants when Abraha had come, and Allah has stopped Qaswa. And so that's where they camped. And then subhanallah, sahaba come complaining to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that uh, there's not much water, the animals need water, we need water, etc. The Rasul sallallahu the miracle that occurred, he called for some water, he gargled, spat it back into that water, and he also had taken an arrow, and he gave it to them, and told them to throw it into the well. And then the Rasul made dua, alhamdulillah, the water increased, and it was sufficient for everyone, alhamdulillah. Also during these days while they were camped at uh, Hudaybiyyah, the Khuza'a tribe, who were the former, the former custodians of the Haram, the former custodians of the Haram were the Khuza'a tribe and before them was the Jurhum tribe. The Khuza'a eventually had taken, had taken over and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's fourth grandfather by the name of Qusay, he married into the Khuza'a tribe and the leader of the Khuza'a then handed over control to Qusay. And that's when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's forefathers, they were the ones who were now the custodians of Mecca al-Mukarrama, or rather more especially the Haram of Mecca al-Mukarrama. So this Khuza'a tribe, they had uh, gifted the Muslims with uh, camels and sheep during these days for their, for their consumption. Also, during this period of time, we find that uh, about 80 of the Quraysh, they tried to attack the Muslims, but they were captured. They were captured. What did the Muslims do with them? Prophet ﷺ ordered that they be set free. 
Why? This is a clear sign, another sign. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a kind gesture. He does not want any fighting. He does not want any fighting at all, subhanAllah. And that image there is an image of uh, the well at Hudaybiyyah. And subhanAllah, we will be discussing the Pledge of Allegiance which the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had taken from the Sahaba under an acacia tree. Not this exact acacia tree, but an acacia tree at that area. Emissaries. So we find that the Quraysh, they sent somebody by the name of Budail ibn Warqa. We do not know the exact order. There were different various emissaries that had come and gone. Uh, Budail ibn Warqa uh, he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Subhanallah, this Budail will eventually accept Islam after the conquest of Mecca. Here, Budail comes, representative of the Quraysh. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says to him, "We haven't come to fight. We are open to any agreement. We are open to any negotiation, any agreement that would honor the sanctity of the Haram, etc. We are not here to fight." Later on, the Quraysh sent somebody by the name of Hulais, and this person was very relig- very religious. And so, when he saw the Muslims with the sacrificial animals, he turned and he went back to the Quraysh, and he says, "These people have come for the rites of pilgrimage. They are not here to fight." You should allow them You are the custodians of the haram You have to allow them You cannot prevent them Like all other Arabs and peoples Are allowed to come to the haram And uh, perform their rites Why are you stopping the Muslims? We find that later on Urwa ibn Mas'ud Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi He was in Makkah al mukarramah He is from Ta'if And so he says to the Quraysh Let me go and speak to Muhammad Let me see what, we, what, what, what can be done And so they grant him permission And so he comes And subhanallah This Urwa ibn Mas'ud Will also become a Muslim uh, after Hunain, after the Battle of Hunain in the year 9 AH, and subhanAllah, he will return to Ta'if, he will do da'wah there, and his people will eventually kill him. Allahumma Urwa ibn Mas'ud was one of those who resembled Isa alayhi salam a lot. Nonetheless, here Urwa, not a Muslim at the time, he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and look at his arrogance. He says that, O oh Muhammad, the Quraysh, they are ready, their women, their men, their children, they will never ever allow you to enter into Makkah al mukarramah And what are you doing? How can you do this? You are breaking the sanctity of the haram. You are coming and you, are, you, you want to break the family ties. You are coming back like this uh, against your people. You have gathered this mob, the scum of the earth, these people around you, and they will leave you. They will desert you. Allah musta'an. When he said that, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala responded to him and he says to him, Umsus Bazar Allat, that go and something, something, swore him, go and something, something, the female idol of, of, uh, of Lat, the people of Thaqif in Ta'if, they had the temple dedicated to the female idol called Lat, and so Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala says to him that go and something, something to thee, to the female idol of Lat, Allah musta'an. And so he says, who said that? And so when he realizes it was Abu Bakr, uh, he doesn't respond. Why? Because of the favors of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala upon him in the old days. We find then also this uh, Urwa ibn Mas'ud is like touching the beard of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he does so, Mughira ibn Shu'ba, who's standing Behind the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Hits the hand of Urwa ibn Mas'ud with his sword And Urwa is like Who is this? And, and he realizes it is Mughira uh, Mughira al-Thaqafi Mughira ibn Shu'ba al-Thaqafi Then he says Oh the Ghudar Ghudar meaning the, uh, the, the, decept, the deceiving one The betraying one What happened? Mughira ibn Shu'ba in his old days Before becoming a Muslim Before becoming a Muslim He was a highway robber he was a highway robber and he had robbed some people and he had killed some people, etc. And then he comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with all of this booty and he embraces Islam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, as for your Islam, we accept it. As for the stolen wealth, this we do not accept. This you, you, you need to get rid of that. And so that's why Urwa ibn Masood says to him, you the betraying one, you the criminal one, etc. Subhanallah Look at this Urwa ibn Mas'ud And his attitude right now But when he goes back to the Quraysh What does he say to them? Now he speaks the truth He says to the Quraysh 
I advise you people to allow them to come to Mecca and perform the Umrah. They've only come to perform the Umrah, they do not want to fight. And in reality, I have been to the palaces of the Caesar, palaces of Najashi and the palaces of this one and that one. And I've not seen a people who, who, who venerate and respect their leader more than the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Muhammad. I've not seen this. In fact, it is stated that uh, when the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was making wudu, then the Sahaba would be there to take the, 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 the water that is dropping off, falling uh, down, they, they, would, they would try to grab all of that water. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to spit to something, they would be there to grab that. Allahu a'lam, some of the historians mention that the Sahaba did this purposefully at this juncture to show these people that look at how dedicated we are to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nonetheless, we do know that the body of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a blessed body and tabarruk is allowed, walhamdulillah. Seeking barakah via that is permissible, walhamdulillah. We find that also the... Uh, the, the, the Quraysh had sent somebody by the name of Mikras ibn Hafs. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a representative by the name of Khirash. And he was sent by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon the animal, the camel of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the name of Tha'lab. What did the Meccans do? Ikrimah, the son of Abu Jahl, Allah musta'an. What did Ikrimah do? Remember, Ikrimah's father, Abu Jahl, was killed in the battle of Badr. Here, Ikrimah, not yet a Muslim. Ikrimah will hamstring the animal, kill the animal, and pounce upon Khirash. And he is about to kill this Khirash representative, messenger, ambassador, Rasul. You don't do this to the messenger. Allahu musta'an. But then others came to the aid of this khirash and thus he was not killed. He returns back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sends another messenger and now he wants to choose Umar. Think about this. The mere fact that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is ready to send another ambassador after what happened shows that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is trying his level best. Negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Let's try. And he chooses Umar. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and says, Ya Rasulullah, I don't think I'm the most appropriate. I don't have family there in Mecca al-Mukarramah to defend me, to support me. Look what they did to Khirash. Maybe a better choice would be Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala an. Uthman ibn Affan is from the tribe of Banu Umayyah. And so he has family there. It would be better. And so Uthman is chosen. Alhamdulillah. He goes to Mecca. He explains matters to the Quraysh. Uh, he tells them that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam invites you people to Islam, and we've only come to perform the Umrah. We do not want to fight. Uh, Uthman, mashaAllah, also met with some of the Muslims in Mecca al mukarrama those who were still hiding the Islam, those who were unable to migrate to Medina al munawwara uh, The Meccans they offer Uthman ibn Affan the opportunity to perform the Umrah himself. And he refused. How can I perform the Umrah when my Nabi has not yet performed? Subhanallah. When some of the Sahaba said, you know, Uthman has probably offered to perform the Tawaf and he probably will do so. He's so lucky. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, I don't think so. Uthman would not do so if I have not yet, if I have not yet performed the Tawaf, if we have not been allowed to do so, subhanallah. Look at the good thoughts the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had with regards to Uthman. Look at the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he defended the honor of his camel when they said it was stubborn. Ulama pull out from that, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, that if the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam defended the honor, defended the honor of a camel from unfounded statements, what about the honor of your brother and your sister with regards to unfounded, unsubstantiated statements, accusations? Allahumma sta'an. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. Uthman radiallahu ta'ala he was held back by the Quraysh uh, plus minus it is stated maybe three days as some mention and so there was a rumor that spread that Uthman was killed Allahu musta'an Allahu musta'an matters have now escalated and uh, subhanallah the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he gathers the sahaba he gathers the sahaba and uh, under the tree under an acacia tree and they had given a pledge to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to fight, to die, to have sabr, to avenge the death of Uthman, not to flee, that they will not flee 
The Prophet sallallahu took his own hand and he put it over his right hand, his left hand over his right, and he said, this is for Uthman. The ulama state that the hand of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on behalf of Uthman was better than Uthman's own hand for Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an, subhanallah. We find that uh, they all pledged allegiance and we find narrations that accept somebody by the name of Jid ibn Qais. He was a munafiq and this individual he hid. He hid uh, uh, behind his camel or somewhere. He did not want to, did not want to pledge. Allah musta'an. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah. Uh, we do find that some historians mention that uh, the head of the munafiqeen, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he was also present at Hudaybiyyah. They mention that uh, when the uh, miracle of the water in the well occurred, then somebody said to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, that uh, why, why don't you believe? I mean, look what a miracle here has just taken place. He says, oh, I, I've seen stuff like this. You know, I've, I've seen many a time stuff like this. And when the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard about what he said, then uh, he says, no, no, I, you know, I'm, uh, we, we just turned the topic around. Allah musta'an. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, this is stated by some historians. Some historians also mention that supposedly the Meccans offered Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul for him to come to Mecca and perform the tawaf. That not the rest of the people, not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but you, O Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, I mean, you are our man, you are our friend, you are one with us, so we allow you. But then he refused for whatever reason, maybe to ensure that uh, he doesn't burn bridges with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allahu a'lam. And so these two incidents, we do find some historians mentioning and thus indicating that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was present at Hudaybiyah. But majority of the historians do not mention his presence. And if he was present, uh, then it might mean that he was present at the Pledge of Allegiance, Bay'atul Ridwan. But that can't be true. Why? Because Allah mentions in the Noble Quran, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah is pleased with the believers, 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 believers. They were the ones who pledged, not the open munafiq. إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ When they pledged to you under the tree. فَعَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ And Allah knew what was in their hearts. Allah obviously knows what's in the heart of the munafiq. And so he couldn't have been one of those there. فَأَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَثَابَهُمْ فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا And Allah has sent down tranquility upon them and promised them a fathan qariba, a manifest victory very, very soon. So the issue that uh, or the claim that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was present at this pledge of allegiance, uh, this uh, cannot be true because this contradicts this verse of the Noble Quran. Also, maybe Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul might have been present. Uh, as uh, those historians do mention the two incidents we spoke about earlier, but they are not explicit in stating that he was there at the at the pledge. Maybe he was present, and just like that munafiq Jid ibn Qais hid, maybe Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul also hid and was not part and parcel of the pledge. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Allah praises this pledge in the Noble Quran as we just saw, subhanAllah. Remember the ranks of the Sahaba. The famous ten granted the glad tidings of paradise. Then we have the Badriyun, and then we have those who were present at the Bay'atul Ridwan. Bay'atul Ridwan. It's called Bay'a of Ridwan because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, laqad radiyallah, radiyallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pleased with them. Soon after, Uthman radiyallahu ta'ala returned, walhamdulillah. With regards to that tree, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, we find that uh, uh, um, Saeed ibn Musayyib, he mentions that his father was present, Saeed ibn Musayyib, one of the great scholars of the Tabi'een. He mentions that his father was present at uh, the Bay'atul Ridwan, and uh, the following year, the year after the Bay'atul Ridwan, when they had passed by that area, they had forgotten which tree it was. 
You know, they were unable to figure out which tree it was. And he mentions this why. Because during his time, uh, people were gathering and they were going to a certain tree and they were performing salah, etc. there. So Abdullah, so Sa'id ibn Musayyib is saying that my father mentions and he was present the following year, they, they forgot which tree it was. And we find during Umar radiallahu's time, people were coming to a certain tree, thinking that this was the tree under which the Pledge of Allegiance was given. People were performing salah there. What did Umar order? Umar ordered the cutting down of the tree. Alhamdulillah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. We find that uh, maybe the Quraysh got word of this pledge and uh, probably they also didn't want any fighting. It's the sacred month, etc. And so what happens now? The Quraysh, they send another negotiator. And this is now Suhail ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala an. Remember Suhail ibn Amr? He was captured at the Battle of Badr, one of the prisoners, and he was ransomed. Umar wanted to, Umar wanted to mutilate him cut his tongue or remove his teeth because he was one of the khatibs of the Quraysh and he would slander the Muslims etc. a lot. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, we cannot do that. And maybe one day you will see something from him, O Umar, that will please you. And that's exactly what will happen. That will happen after the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passes away. The Suhail ibn Amr will be a Muslim, masha'Allah. He embraces Islam. He embraces Islam uh, later on in history. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, Suhail ibn Amr ensured that the people of Makkah al-Mukarramah remained firm upon Islam. Walhamdulillah. Similarly, he was present at the Battle of Uhud. He was present at Khandak one year earlier. Allah musta'an. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, Suhail ibn Amr and uh, Huwaitib, Huwaitib ibn Abdul Uzza, they were the ones who now come to talk to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Long negotiations occur between them. And eventually, masha'Allah, eventually the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Suhail ibn Amr, they sit down to have an agreement signed between both parties. Masha'Allah. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Suhail ibn Amr coming, he did say to the Sahaba, لَقَدْ سَهُلَ لَكُمْ أَمْرُكُمْ That your, peop- your people's affair has become easy. The man's name is Sahel. Sahel means easy. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pulled out from that a good omen. The man's name is easy. And so things will be easy. Walhamdulillah. Obviously, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, what, what, what do you think the Sahaba were thinking? Obviously, we are going to perform the Umrah. We are going to perform the Umrah. We are going to go to Mecca. We are going to make tawaf around the Kaaba. We are going to stand on the mountain of Safa and Marwa. Walhamdulillah. We will drink from the tasty, sweet water of Zamzam, masha'Allah. That's obviously what they are thinking. And remember that uh, this Suhail ibn Amr, subhanallah, he was somebody who had a good heart. Uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had requested help protection from Suhail ibn Amr when he was returning from Ta'if, when he needed to enter Mecca al-Mukarramah once again and he didn't have protection his uncle had passed away his visa like had expired and so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Suhail ibn Amr, you grant me protection but Suhail refused he turned down that proposal. He turned down that uh, uh, that request. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam got the help from Mut'im ibn Adi. But the point is, the mere fact that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even considered Suhail ibn Amr shows us Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't ask from Abu Jahal or etc. Those guys, but he asked from Suhail ibn Amr because Suhail ibn Amr probably had a good heart. Alhamdulillah. And as we said, we say radiallahu an because he eventually will become Muslim. But look at his mokif right now. Look at his situation right now. Look at his position right now. They agree to this sulh. Ali radiallahu ta'ala an is the scribe. And it is stated, write down, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Suhail says, I, I don't accept any Rahman. Uh, who is Rahman? I don't accept that. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Ali, write down, Bismika Allahumma. And so that's what was written. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim was erased. Then this is what Suhail ibn Amr and Muhammad, the Rasul of Allah, have agreed upon. 
So Hale says, I don't accept that you are the Rasul of Allah. Write there Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Ali, write down Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Ali is like, no, ya Rasulullah. I mean, I mean, how can we give in to this here? You are the Rasul of Allah, whether they like it or not. He says to Ali, remove it, remove it. Ali, Ali is out of, out of uh, respect for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, out of honoring the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ali says, no, ya Rasulullah, I mean, I, I can't do that. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks, where is it written? Show me. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam erased it himself and ordered that it be written, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, ibn Abdullah. We find that subhanallah, some ulama, because the narration mentions and then kataba, and then he wrote, he wrote, an indication that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wrote Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And so Abu walid al-Baji, famous scholar of Andalusia, Spain, he said that this is proof that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could write. Maybe before revelation he couldn't, but now he could. And subhanallah, you found fatawa of kufr upon him. Many ulama stated he has left the fold of Islam. Why? Because Allah mentioned in the noble Quran that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam couldn't write. And so now Abu walid is, is contradicting that. Abu walid said, no, I'm not contradicting that. Uh, that there is to do with before for revelation, not after revelation. Ala kulli hal, majority of the scholars state that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not write before and after revelation. And this was a miracle for the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that even though he couldn't read and write, he came with this Quran. Walhamdulillah. And how do they explain this narration? They say that uh, the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Ali, show me where it is written, shows us that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, couldn't read and so he needed Ali to show him. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered someone to write it. Not that he wrote it himself, but rather as the Amir he ordered and so they attributed it to him but he ordered somebody to to write there wallahu ta'ala a'lam some ulama state no maybe the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam could write muhammad ibn abdullah that doesn't negate that him not being able to generally write that doesn't negate that he was still ummi was still illiterate maybe a person can write their name they, they see this many a times, etc. But other stuff they cannot write. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Nonetheless, majority of the scholars state, the Rasul, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ordered someone to write. And thus it was written, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And it states, one of the conditions, that the Muslims, you go back to Medina al munawwara and you come back next year, not this year, not this year. Imagine the feelings of the Sahaba. Imagine the emotions of the Sahaba when they hear this. And then they find the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agreeing to this. Allahu musta'an. That you come back next year. You don't come with your fighting swords. You come and you remain in Mecca for only three days next year. Not this year. Go back home now. And then, if there's any Meccans who embrace Islam and they come to Medina al munawwara then if we request that they be returned to Makkah al mukarramah you people must kick them out. You people must send them off. Send them back to Makkah al mukarramah And the opposite, if anyone in Medina al munawwara wants to leave Medina and come to Makkah, Let's say he leaves Islam, etc. He must be allowed to come to Makkah al mukarramah Allahu musta'an. He must be allowed to return back to Makkah al mukarramah Subhanallah. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah. First condition, second condition, third condition. All of these conditions seem to be going against against the Muslims. Imagine the Sahaba all sitting there, all watching this here. They were in shock, unhappy. Maybe if one had to do a survey with them at that time, vote that uh, how many of you agree or disagree with this? I would think that majority of them would say that we disagree. Generally, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes shura with the sahaba. But here now, on this day, at this time, he's not making shura. The conditions were bad. They were outwardly against the Muslims. This means we're not going to Mecca. No drinking zamza, no pawaf around the Kaaba. And then subhanallah, then we find that uh, it mentions that this uh, contract, this treaty will last for 10 years. Hostilities would cease for 10 years. Whoever wants to ally with the Muslims can ally. Whoever wants to ally with the Quraysh can do so. We find that uh, the Khuza'a tribe, they allied with the Muslims. While all of this is happening, 
somebody comes there in chains, Abu Jandal, Abu Jandal, the son of Suhail ibn Amr, the chief negotiator of the Quraysh, he comes there. And he's in chains. And he comes and he wants to return with the Muslims. He's escaped the persecution in Mecca al mukarrama His father had him chained, subhanAllah. And so while his father was away, he managed to escape. And so when he comes, Abu Jandal says that uh, this person here, or rather the father, Abu Suhail ibn Amr, he says that this one here, Abu Jandal, my son, he is the first one that we will implement this treaty upon. Abu Jandal is like, Ya Rasulullah, are you people going to send me back? Send me back to Makkah al mukarrama These people are going to torture me. They're going to put me into a fitna, etc. How can you send me back? And the Sahaba are all around there. Abu, uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala and Umar comes to Abu Jandal and he's like indicating that take my sword, take my sword, you know, he, attack your father, kill your father. The Suhail ibn Amr had stood up and he hit his son in front of everyone. And he says, and he grabbed his son and he says, this one here is the first one we will implement this treaty upon. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that, uh, oh Suhail, we, we haven't yet signed the matter. We haven't yet agreed on matters, etc. Suhail says, well, in that case, there's no agreement. There's no agreement between us. If you do not implement it upon Abu Jandal first, then there's no agreement between us. Allah musta'an. Imagine Umar radiallahu ta'ala and the rest of the Sahaba, subhanAllah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he then looks at Suhail ibn Amr and... Uh, uh, he says that you, you, you will allow it. You will allow him. I mean, you know, if we had to, uh, you know, your, you, the fact that you are a noble Arab, you will allow and you will give him to me. You will give him to me. Suhail says, no, I will not. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, you, you will give him to me. Suhail says, no, I will not. We will implement the treaty upon my son first before anyone else. Allahu musta'an. Imagine the emotions. Imagine the escalation of tensions. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam looks at Abu Jandal and he says, "Ya Abu Jandal, isbir wahtasib. Be patient and hope for reward. Your reward is with Allah subhanahu wa taala. Allah will make a way out for you." And thus. This treaty was agreed upon. The signatories were Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, uh, Abdullah ibn Suhail ibn Amr, one of the sons of Suhail ibn Amr, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, uh, Muhammad ibn Maslama al-Ansari. And uh, subhanallah, we find that uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, are you not the Nabi of Allah? Are you not the Nabi of Allah? He says, yes, I am. Are we not upon haqq? Are they not upon batil? Yes, we are. And they are upon batil. Then how can we accept this? How can we accept these disgraceful conditions? How can we accept this? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, that I am the Rasul of Allah, and I will not disobey Allah. This is the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Ya Rasulullah, did you not promise us? Did you not tell us that we will be making tawaf? That we will go, we will make tawaf? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Umar, did I tell you this year? Did I promise you this year? You will do so. I didn't promise you this year. Subhanallah. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and after speaking to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he goes to, he goes to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and imagine, I mean, generally, one might think that you go to Abu Bakr first, then maybe you feel there's still some room, there's some hope. Then you go to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After you go to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I mean the matter is closed. But look at Umar. He went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered him. But he still feels that there's still some room, there's still some opportunity. He goes to Abu Bakr and he says the same. That uh, are we not upon haqq, are they not upon batil? And uh, uh, why are we accepting all of this here? Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an responds to him a similar response like the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, we are upon haqq, they are upon batil. Why are we accepting the, this is? He is the Rasul of Allah and he will not disobey Allah. And you Umar, know your position. Watch out, be careful. Know your position. Don't have this like uh, jur'ah, this audacity, etc. to question. Nowhere to stop, subhanallah. Ya Abdullah, ya amat Allah. Look at the honor, the virtue of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. That's why he is Thaniyath name. He is the second of the two. He was the one in the cave with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is always behind the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is always upon what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was upon, subhanallah. 
And so, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, we find our Umar, radiallahu ta'ala an, he would say later on, that I continue to give charity and sadaqah and all of this and do good deeds, you know, to try to expiate for my audacity, for my jur'a on that day, when I was like, Putting myself forward before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhanallah. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah. The strategy of Hudaybiyyah. The fact that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sees Abu Jandal. He knows that Abu Jandal will return to Makkah al-Mukarramah. He will be tortured. But for the greater maslaha, for the greater maslaha, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agrees to these conditions. And this was the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we will see, this was a great manifest victory. We found that some ulama taking out from this, that especially Muslims living in the West, that uh, you find that your government, you find that so-and-so is a citizen of uh, one of the Western countries, but that same country is maybe at war with one of the Muslim nations, one of the Muslim countries. So this Muslim living in the West, he feels, how can I be here? Uh, you know, uh, is, this, is it even permissible for me to live in this land, etc.? Remember, your passport, technically that is an agreement between you and, uh, and that land, between you and that government. Uh, we're not talking about uh, participating in the armed forces, etc. No, but you merely being a citizen in that country. We state that, that there can be different alliances and different treaties. That, uh, that's what one of the points we can learn from the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah. That you being a citizen of that western country, even though that country might be at war with another Muslim nation fighting Muslim somewhere else, this uh, doesn't necessarily should make this this uh, doesn't uh, necessarily uh, negate uh, your alliance or your treaty or your agreement uh, with that uh, with that nation with that country. You're being a citizen, a law-abiding citizen of that of that country. One shouldn't feel that one is living a dip, double life, or one shouldn't feel that uh, one is being treacherous to the Muslim Ummah. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. This is something that, for example, Sheikh Yasser Qadi mentions uh, in the discussion related to the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, also take note that uh, uh, the ulama, they talk, they discuss that the fact that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agreed to a condition that if somebody in Medina al-Munawwara who leaves Islam wants to go back to Makkah al-Mukarramah, you should allow him to do so. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agreed to this condition. So they discuss whether the penalty upon the murtad the penalty upon the murtad, the apostate, according to majority of the scholars, is what? Is the death sentence. Well, they talk, this death sentence, is this a had punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, the ruler doesn't have a say in the matter and we need to implement, that's all that we have to do, that's all that we have the choice in? Or is it a type of ta'aziri punishment? Is it a type of uh, ta'azir punishment where the ruler, the judge, the qadi, they do have a say in the matter? They point out, some ulama point out, the mere fact that the Prophet ﷺ agreed that if anyone leaves Islam in Medina al munawwara we will send him back to Makkah al mukarramah this is an indication that the had of uh, irtidad, the had of apostasy, or the penalty, the uh, the punishment for apostasy, is not a had punishment, but rather it is a ta'zir punishment, and it is up to the discretion of the ruler or the discretion of the qadi, and that's a discussion there. Wallahu taala alam. This is a proof for those who say it is a discretionary type of penalty, discretionary type of punishment, and not a had punishment which must be implemented under all circumstances. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, after all of this was said and done, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now they were in the state of, they were in the state of ihram, they were in the state of ihram, and they obviously need to leave that state of ihram, they're not going to Mecca, and so they were prevented from continuing the journey, so the Prophet ﷺ tells the Sahaba three times that uh, shave your heads and exit the state of Ihram, but they do not obey, they do not listen. Three times he mentions, but they don't listen. They feel that there still may be some hope. Maybe we can convince him. Maybe we can do away with all of this here and we can go to Makkah. Rather we maybe fight and go. That is better. 
Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he goes to his wife Um Salama and he says that this is what's happening. They're not listening. She says, "You go out and you shave your head and you slaughter your animal, and they will follow suit." That you lead by example. And that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did. And when the Sahaba saw that, they realized that there's no hope. We cannot go to Mecca. We will not be going to Mecca. And they all then followed suit. Walhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Prophet ﷺ had also brought along uh, one of the animals of Abu Jahl that was uh, uh, captured by the Muslims. And this was slaughtered. And the meat was sent to Mecca al mukarrama for distribution. Uh, the return to Medina al munawwara after all of this, uh, they returned back to Medina al munawwara after being absent for plus minus one and a half months. One and a half months, subhanAllah. On the way back, Surah Al-Fatih was revealed and Allah mentions, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina, that we have granted to you a manifest, a manifest victory. It is stated that Surah Al-Fatih, that uh, it was revealed in one go, as opposed to like other surahs of the Quran, which were revealed parts, uh, parts here and parts there, etc. Like Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed over nine years, whereas Surah Al-Fatih was revealed in one go. And Allah mentions that this was a manifest victory. Manifest victory. And the Prophet sallallahu mentions this to Umar. And Umar says, Ya Rasulullah, it's, it's, it's a victory. Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, yes, as we will discuss very soon, inshaAllah. We found that on the way back to Medina al munawwara there was a Salat al-Fajr that the Sahaba, they overslept. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also overslept. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala was the one who was supposed to wake them up, but he overslept, subhanAllah. And so they all awoke after the sun had risen, and they had then prayed their Salah, walhamdulillah. Post Hudaybiyyah, we find that the sister, stepsister of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an, by the name of Umm Kulthum bint Uqba, she had migrated to Medina al Munawwara, uh, but she was not sent. She was Muslim now. She was not sent back to Makkah al Mukarramah. But now, didn't we agree that we will send the people back? Ah, uh, but it was not agreed with regards to women. With regards to women, and Surah Al Mumtahina states that you cannot send back these Muslim women to non Muslim husbands. And so eventually, uh, she remained in Medina al munawwara and the technicality was that in the treaty, it was not specified that this includes women. It was not specific. Women were not mentioned there. And so on this technicality, uh, the Muslim women were not returned back to Medina, back to Makkah al mukarramah She eventually got married to Zayd ibn Haritha, radiallahu ta'ala an, and her father was Uqba ibn Abi Mu'it, that criminal who had thrown the camel's intestines on the back of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma sta'an. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah, we learn from Hudaybiyyah, subhanallah, post Hudaybiyyah, that the Muslims... They were treated on an equal, independent footing with the Quraysh. They are now negotiating with the Quraysh. They have reached that level, mashaAllah, that they are now independent, they are powerful. This is acknowledgement of the Quraysh with regards to the entity, the Muslims in Medina al munawwara this is i'tiraf. This is acknowledgement of them and their power. Alhamdulillah. This also provided an opportunity for people to now talk about Islam, interact with family members who are Muslim, investigate without being threatened, etc. It allowed for people to join family ties, to visit one another. This created a beautiful environment for the spread of Tawheed, the spread of Islam. Alhamdulillah. Also provided an opportunity for the Muslims to focus on Khaybar. That's where the Jewish tribes were settled and they are the ones who are causing a lot of problems. The Muslims could focus on them. We find that subhanAllah, Imam Az-Zuhri, rahimahullah, who died in the year 124, he mentions that from the Sulh of Hudaybiyyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, to the conquest of Makkah in the year 8 after Hijrah, this is only plus minus uh, 17, 18 months. 17, 18 months. There were more people who became Muslim during this period than the period from the time of the revelation, when the Prophet ﷺ started receiving the revelation, from that time up to up to Hudaybiyyah, subhanAllah. 
that entire period, the number of people who became Muslim were less than the period between Hudaybiyah and the conquest of Mecca, 6 AH to the year 8 AH, plus minus 17, 18 months. More people embraced Islam now. That's why Allah mentions it's a great manifest victory. Walhamdulillah. And we find that Ibn Hisham, he says that the proof of what Imam Az-Zuhri said, that at Hudaybiyah, our Rasul sallallahu had 1,400 with him. Whereas... 17 months later, 18 months later, the conquest of Mecca, he will have 10,000, 10,000, subhanallah, subhanallah. Imagine the yaqeen of the Sahaba. This incident was a test of the faith of the Sahaba. Now imagine when the Sahaba saw all of these people becoming Muslim. When the Sahaba saw that the Treaty of Hudaybiyah opened the road to Makkah al mukarrama It paved the road to the conquest of Makkah. Why? How? Because the Quraysh will eventually break the Treaty of Hudaybiyah 18 months later when they help when they have their ally against the allies of the Muslims, thus they broke the treaty, which allowed the Muslims to now come and take over Makkah al mukarramah because there's no treaty between us at all now. Alhamdulillah, you people were treacherous. You broke the treaty within, within 18 months, subhanAllah. Forget 10 years. And so, imagine the yaqeen in the hearts of the Sahaba. When at the time of Hudaybiyah, they were like, I mean, this going against the Muslims, this is going against the interests of the Muslims. But months later, 18, 19, 20 months later, then they realized, subhanAllah, Allah mentioned in the Quran, and we saw it with our eyes, that this was a manifest victory, mashaAllah. Imagine the yaqeen in their hearts. That's why you had some of the uh, sahaba later on, they would say that, ittahimu ar-ra'i, that beware of your own opinion, because we voiced our opinions, we had our opinions, but in the face of revelation, we saw how our opinions were incorrect, and the revelation was correct, subhanAllah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, had it not been for Hudaybiyah, there would not have been any conquest of Mecca al mukarrama Also, you found that uh, there was uh, a Sahabi by the name of Abu Basir. Uh, he had uh, he had left Mecca al mukarrama and he comes to Medina al munawwara Utbah ibn Usaid. And the Meccans requested his return. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, I mean, I don't have a choice in this matter. We have to honor this. And, you know, you go back with this guy. You need to go back with to Mecca al mukarrama um, You can't remain here. On the way back, Abu, Abu Basir, he, he was able to overpower them. He killed one of them and he escapes. And he comes back to Medina al munawwara Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, you can't remain here. You can't stay here. So what did Abu Basir do? He went and settled uh, in an area outside of Mecca, outside of Medina al munawwara uh, on one of the uh, caravan pathways, one of the caravan uh, uh, highways. And what he would do there, he would raid the caravans of the Quraysh and others. Uh, subhanAllah. And so others from Mecca al mukarrama when they embraced Islam and they left Mecca al mukarrama they know we can't go to Medina al munawwara we will not get sanctuary there, we do not want to put the Prophet ﷺ in an awkward position. So let's go to Abu Basir. And so they would settle there. Eventually, 70, 80, 90, up to about 300 of them settled with Abu Basir and they were raiding the caravans of the Quraysh left, right and center. Until eventually the Quraysh, they come to the Prophet and they request him to no longer honor this condition in the treaty and they say to him you know what these people who settle there you allow them to come to Medina al munawwara because it's a greater harm upon us that they are settled there rather they settle in Medina and Medina al munawwara and that would be better for us walhamdulillah and so the Quraysh were the ones who then uh, broke that condition of the treaty. Alhamdulillah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. As we have seen, as we have seen, Subhanallah, this treaty of Hudaybiyah was a manifest victory, MashaAllah. That uh, Abu Basir settled there. Then later on, Abu Jandal, our Abu Jandal escapes from Makkah. He also settles with Abu Basir, uh, Walid ibn Al Walid, the brother of Khalid ibn Al Walid. He also settles there. Walhamdulillah, MashaAllah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. After Hudaybiyah, or around uh, that time, uh, 
uh, we find that subhanallah, our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gets married to Um Habiba. Um Habiba, the daughter of Abu Sufyan, the sister of Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an. Her father, her brother, were not Muslim by this time. Her husband, Ubaidullah ibn Jash, he was one of those Muslims who migrated to Abyssinia, but famously stated that he left Islam for Christianity. And so later on, she was all alone. He passed away. And so she cannot go to Mecca. Her father is not a Muslim. And so the Prophet ﷺ heard about this. And he proposed via Najashi. And Najashi was the one who oversaw this uh, nikah. Najashi was the one who paid her mahar. 400 dinars. This was the most expensive mahar that any of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ ever received. 400 dinars. Alhamdulillah. And so eventually, Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha She then makes her way to Medina al-Munawwara There were some other matters We stated that the sulh of Hudaybiyyah This was agreed upon for 10 years We find that some ulama state That any sort of agreement like this Between the Muslims and the enemies uh, Cannot be for a longer period than 10 years Whereas others said no uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says that this matter is based upon maslaha. If it is the maslaha for more than 10 years, no problem at all. Alhamdulillah. We also learn that our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he really tried his level best. He really went uh, and tried his level best to keep the uh, the communication lines open, the negotiations open, uh, have open dialogue, mashallah. We saw negotiators, ambassadors up and down, alhamdulillah. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions a fa'idah. He says that we learn from Hudaybiyyah that we are allowed and it is good and it is permissible and recommended for us to join with the mushrikeen, with the kuffar, with the ahlul bid'ah in those matters which honor and make ta'zim of the hurumat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, for example, the Christians and the Jews and the Ahlul Bid'a or whoever else it might be, that uh, they are putting forward a bill to prohibit gambling, then this is something that we join them in. To prohibit uh, pornography, then this is something that we join them in. As long as we are honoring the that which uh, uh, is sanctified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we are honoring uh, that which is honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we are observing that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, then we join with them in this matter. Uh, we find that subhanallah, uh, our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this matter uh, of Hudaybiyyah and the agreement, uh, the verse of the Quran is quite clear and teaches us the lesson. Asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. That maybe you dislike something but it's good for you. Maybe you love something but it is bad for you. Allah knows better. Allah knows best. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. And so we also touched upon the matter that different treaties and alliances are allowed, especially in today's time in the absence of a caliphate. uh, One can have an alliance, a treaty with a certain entity, even though that same entity might be harming Muslims uh, in some other place. And this is the reality of those Muslims who are living in the West. Allah musta'an. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, numerous benefits and one of those important incidents in the life of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The image before you is this masjid, uh, this uh, old masjid uh, which was built in that area of Hudaybiyyah. Uh, beside it is another masjid, a much newer masjid called the Masjid of Hudaybiyyah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Until we meet again, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the best in this world and in the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the true love of Muhammad ibn Abdullah salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our knowledge of the seerah and to make us living ambassadors of al-Islam. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah, hayyakum Allah, barakallahu feekum. Hada, hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaykum. ورحمة الله وبركاته